understands, as I do, that there is something absurd about a situation uh, in which we as a nation end up spending almost twice as much per person on health care as any other nation on earth, and yet we end up with tens of millions of people who are uninsured, people who are underinsured, uh, and we have almost a million Americans this year uh, who are facing bankruptcy because of medically related illnesses. And I think as he talked about today, uh, understanding that small business is the economic engine of this country, there is something absurd uh, when we have small businesses uh, desperately trying to provide health insurance uh, for their employees and are finding it harder and harder to do that. I just want to congratulate Senator Brown uh, for the work he is doing uh, on health care. Uh, Mr. President, as I think every American understands, uh, we are in the midst of the worst economic crisis uh, since the Great Depression. Uh, I find it interesting that there are some people out there, some economists, including the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Mr. Bernanke, who have told us, and I quote, the recession is very likely over, end of quote. Well, I would suggest to Mr. Bernanke, come to the state of Vermont, go to California, go to Nevada, go to Ohio, go to any state in the country, go out on the street and ask people whether they think this recession is over. And they may say, well, it may be over for the large banks who are bailed out by taxpayers, but it is not over for working families. And in fact, according to the latest Washington Post, ABC News poll, 82% uh, of Americans disagree with Mr. Bernanke. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the American people do not believe that the recession is over. Uh, and of course, they are right. Uh, the recession may be over for banks who are now starting to be profitable for Goldman Sachs, uh, who are paying out huge bonuses uh, to their top executives. But trust me, on Main Street, on family farms all over this country, in factories all over this country, this recession most certainly is not over. Uh, Mr. President, since the beginning of this recession, in December of 2007, 7.6 7 million Americans have lost their jobs. Now, the official unemployment rate has doubled, going from 4.9 percent to 9.8 percent. But what is extremely important to understand when we look at the economy today is that the official unemployment statistics do not reflect the real reality of what's going on in our economy. Because official statistics do not include people who have given up looking for work. If you are in a community where 15 or 20 percent of the people are unemployed, you have given up looking for work, but you are not part of the official unemployment statistics. And what happens if you want to work 40 hours a week, but you can only find a job for 20 hours a week or 25 hours a week? Well, you're also not a statistic. So the reality is that if you add all of those factors together, people who are officially unemployed, people who have given up looking for work, people who are working part-time when they want to work full-time, what you're looking at is 17 percent of working-age Americans today are in that category, which adds up to 26 million Americans, an astronomical number an indication of a real catastrophe in our economy. So, Mr. Bernanke, I'm sorry to disagree with you, but in my view, and in the view of the vast majority of the American people, this recession is not over. And in fact, in terms of unemployment numbers, it may in fact even be getting worse. Mr. President, and the issue that we are dealing with right now has to address the crisis of long-term unemployment. It's one thing to lose your job and get another job a few weeks later is another thing not to be able to find a job month after month after month, and there are millions of Americans in that category. Mr. President, today, 5.4 million Americans have been unemployed for over six months, the highest on record. Let me repeat that. 5.4 million Americans have been unemployed for over six months the highest on record. So long-term unemployment is a major, major crisis in this country, and it is one that we have got to address, and it is one that we have to deal with in terms of extending unemployment benefits. Uh, the average length of unemployment is now 27 weeks. That's over six months. 
That's over half a year. And that is the longest since the end of World War II. There are fewer jobs in America today than there were in the year 2000, even though the workforce has grown by 12 million since then. This is a shrinking workforce. We now have the fewest manufacturing jobs than at any time since April of 1941, eight months before the start of World War II. And the importance of that is that manufacturing was the mechanisms by which working families were able to carve out a middle-class existence. They had decent wages, decent benefits. They had a union, they may have had a pension program. But today we now have the fewest manufacturing jobs than any time since April of 1941. Mr. President, home foreclosures are the highest on record, turning the American dream of home ownership into an American nightmare for millions of people. Today, and there is nothing that we should be proud of in saying this, today the United States has the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. We have the highest infant mortality rate. We have the highest overall poverty rate. And at the same time, we have the largest gap between the wealthy and everybody else. So what we have seen for a number of years is a collapse in the middle class, certainly gone on a lot longer than just since the financial collapse. But we have also seen an increase in wealth amongst the top 1% and that gap between the very rich and everybody else is going wider and wider. You know, Mr. President, from a moral perspective, not to mention an economic perspective, uh, we have got to address the reality that the top 1% today earns more income than the bottom 50%. Top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. We're becoming two very, very different countries. People on top, incredible wealth. You know, CEOs on Wall Street making hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars in a hedge fund. Yet working people seeing their incomes decline, working longer hours for lower wages. Actually today, a two-income family has less disposable income than a one-income family did 30 years ago. That's what's going on in America. Poverty increasing, middle class shrinking, gap between the very rich and everybody else uh, is growing wider. Mr. President, even before, and this is an important point to make, obviously we know what happened on Wall Street a little over a year ago. We know what that collapse has done. We know the outrageous behavior on Wall Street has precipitated us into this very, very severe recession. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. If by some miracle tomorrow we, we, we manage to go back to where we were before the financial collapse on Wall Street, you know what? We would still be in very bad shape not a question of, wow, wasn't, weren't things great before the collapse on Wall Street and, and, and the, the development of this major recession. No, things were not great back there. And let me just mention this. Uh, during the presidency of George Bush, let me just talk a little bit what happened during those eight year, that eight-year period. Uh, when President Bush was in office from the year 2000 and 2008, 8.2 million more Americans uh, slipped out of the middle class and into poverty. That's what happened during that period. And I might mention, Mr. President, you may recall, it's really frightening to think about us, how during much of that period, the Secretary of Treasury, the President was saying, the economy is robust, gross national product is expanding. But that was the reality for working families. People slipping out of the middle class and into poverty. During that same period, you know, we're dealing with health care right now. And one of the reasons that we need a national health care program guaranteeing health care to all people is during that same period, 7.8 million more Americans were uninsured, lost their health insurance. We're now up to about 46 million people without any health insurance. That number is going up every single day. But during the Bush era, we lost close to 8 million Americans lost their health insurance. During the year 2000 and 2008, four and a half million manufacturing jobs disappeared. And I talked a moment ago about the importance of manufacturing. Yeah, I know it's not a sexy job 
but it was a means by which millions and millions of Americans went to work every day. They produced real products. They had real income. It was a vehicle. Manufacturing was and is a vehicle by which working Americans can make it into the middle class. During the Bush tenure, 3.2 million workers have lost their pensions, with the result that about half of American workers in the private sector today have no pension whatsoever. You know, there was a time, I know it's a radical idea to even think about it, there was a time when millions of Americans who worked had a defined pension plan, defined benefit pension plan. They actually knew that they were going to have a pension. Boy, what a radical idea. That doesn't exist any anymore. Uh, during the Bush era, median household income declined by over $2,100, from $52,500 to $50,303. According to a, an article that appeared a couple of months ago in USA Today, from 2000 to 2008, middle class men experienced an 11.2% drop in their incomes a reduction of $7,700 adjusting for inflation. This is unbelievable. During that period, middle class men saw an 11% drop in their income. Middle class women in this age group saw a 4.8% decline in their incomes as well. And the important point to be made here is that when you hear economists talking about the economy in abstract ways, oh, we have 3% growth this quarter, isn't that great? Yeah, that's an important fact, but it's not the most important fact. The most important fact is what happens to ordinary people. And this is what happens to ordinary people. People who are 45 to 54 years of age lost $7,700 in the Bush economy. And that's true today, it's true then. Focus on what's happening to ordinary people. Mr. President, with all of that, with the long-term trends, in which the middle class has declined, with the fact that since the greed and illegal behavior of Wall Street has driven us into the deep, deep recession we're in right now, working families all over this country are desperately in need of help, and they're looking to their federal government to provide that help. And that is why it is so important that we pass an extension in unemployment benefits, and I find it hard to believe why my Republican colleagues continue to delay this legislation from being implemented. But Mr. President, we have got to do more than that. Yes, we have got to extend unemployment, that goes without saying, but we have got to do more than that. We have got to ask ourselves why our economy is in the shape that it is right now. And that will precipitate a major debate and a major discussion of something that we as a nation have got to have. We have got to ask ourselves, not just the causation of the recession that we're in right now, the role that Wall Street has played, but long term, why since the 19, early 1970s has the middle class continued to shrink? What are the causes of that? Why do we have the highest rate of poverty of any major nation on earth? Why is it that today, People are losing their homes and their pensions and their life savings and their ability to send their kids to college. Clearly short term, it is imperative that we investigate thoroughly and that we hold accountable those crooks on Wall Street who have done so much damage to the American people. It is simply not acceptable that they be allowed to continue the behavior that drove this country into this severe recession. We need to understand how it happened. We need to hold accountable those people who caused this crisis. And where there is illegal behavior, those people should learn what the penal system of this country is about. You know, one of the things, Mr. President, that really amazes me is that I have yet to see, nor have the American people yet to see, one of those folks on Wall Street whose greed and recklessness has caused this recession, has caused this intense suffering all over this country. Have you seen one of those guys go before television, get on TV and say to the American people, I apologize. I'm sorry for our greed. I'm sorry that the fact that we cost millions of people their jobs and their health care and their savings and their pensions. We are sorry. I haven't seen that. In fact, what we are seeing 
is these guys on Wall Street spending millions and millions of dollars every day, every week, every month on lobbying in order to make sure that we don't bring about the reforms to prevent them from continuing to do what they did, which caused this recession. These guys live in a world of their own, a world of entitlement, a world in which their actions, they do not seem to understand that their actions have widespread consequences in terms of destroying the economic well-being of millions of people. All they seem to think about is, gee, I only made $100 million last year. Can't get by on that. I need my 18th home and my 16th car and my 18th country club membership. For them, enough is never enough. More and more greed and more and more selfishness. And that is an issue we have got to deal with. Mr. President, it only took a couple of weeks for Congress to give Wall Street the largest bailout in history, some $700 billion. But the truth is that up until this point, we have done very little to make sure that this financial crisis does not occur again. These guys want to go right back to where they were. They want the freedom to speculate, the feed freedom to convert their financial institutions into large gambling casinos. Mr. President, the federal government provided a $182 billion bailout to AIG, a $50 billion bailout to Citigroup, a $50 billion bailout to Bank of America, $25 billion bailout to Wells Fargo, a $25 billion bailout to J.P. Morgan Chase, and on and on it goes. Yet we have asked them for nothing in return. Here are tens of billions of dollars. What are you going to do? What are you going to do for the American people that have bailed you out? Now, Mr. President, I know that reforming the banking sector is not going to be easy. After all, the banking and insurance lobbyists have spent over $5 billion on campaign contributions and lobbying activities over the past decade in support of deregulation. Well, they were all over this place telling us, telling the Congress, just trust us, you know, deregulate us. Let us do what we want to do. We're going to create wealth for all of the American people. Well, there were some of my colleagues who actually believed that. I happen not to be one of them, uh, but some of them did, and, and we deregulated, and we let them do whatever they wanted to do, and we are where we are today. Uh, Mr. President, in 2007 alone, if you can believe this, I and mean, this is what goes on, the financial sector employed nearly 3,000 separate lobbyists, lobbyists to influence federal policy making. Got that? Let's see, 100 members of the Senate, 435 in the House, that equals 535 members of Congress, and they had nearly 3,000 individual lobbyists to influence federal policy making. Over a 10 year period, they spent $5 billion. And that, my friends, is why the rich get richer, almost everybody else gets poorer. Mr. President, we have got to address the issue of Wall Street, and let me uh, make some suggestions as to what we have got to do. We need, in fact, a thorough investigation as to how this happened, and we need to hold those people accountable. And I hope that we can do that. I think the American people are asking questions, and they are right to demand answers. Thank you. But what we also have got to do is we have got to deal with this issue of too big to fail. And what I have said ever since this financial crisis began, if a financial institution is too big to fail, that financial institution is too big to exist. We need to do exactly what Teddy Roosevelt did back in the trust busting days, and we need to start breaking up these huge financial institutions. We cannot continue to be held hostage by them, such that if they fail, they take down the entire system with them, so we have to prop them up and bail them out. And I would mention, Mr. President, interestingly enough, that is exactly what they are doing right now in the United Kingdom. Let me quote from the Washington Post, and I quote, the British government announced Tuesday that it will break up parts of major financial institutions bailed out by taxpayers. The British government, spurred on by European regulators, is forcing the Royal Bank of Scotland, Lloyds Banking Group, and Northern Rock to sell off parts of their operations. The Europeans are calling for more and smaller banks 
to increase competition and eliminate the threat posed by banks so large that they must be rescued by taxpayers no matter how they conducted their business in order to avoid damaging the global financial system. End of quote, Washington Post. And you know what? Our friends in the UK are doing exactly the right thing to do, and that's what we should be doing. But that's not just my opinion. A growing number of experts, both on the left and on the right, are coming to the same conclusion. On October 15th, Alan Greenspan, probably the man more than any other individual responsible for the deregulatory efforts which led to this financial crisis, admitted last year that his views on deregulation were wrong, and he was quoted in Bloomberg News as saying, quote, if they are too big to fail, they are too big. In 1911, we broke up Standard Oil, so what happened? The individual parts became more valuable than the whole. Maybe that's what we need to do, end of quote. Alan Greenspan, the man whose deregulatory leadership helped create this disaster, now perhaps understands that that whole philosophy of deregulation, letting big banks do whatever they want, letting them merge with insurance companies, maybe that was not quite right. Former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker, who has advised the Obama administration, supports breaking up big banks so that they no longer pose systemic risk to the entire economy. According to a recent article in the New York Times, Volcker said, and I quote, people say I'm old-fashioned and banks can no longer be separated from non-bank activity. That argument brought us to where we are today, end of quote, Paul Volcker, absolutely right. New York Times said that under Volcker's plan, quote, J.P. Morgan Chase would have to give up the trading operations acquired from Bear Stearns. Bank of America and Merrill Lynch would go back to being separate companies. Goldman Sachs could no longer be a bank holding company, end of quote, New York Times. And in my view, Mr. President, that is exactly what needs to happen. What insanity that when individuals lose their health insurance, tough luck. Small businesses go bankrupt, tough luck. But if you're a large financial institution and you act in an illegal, greedy way, we say, hey, no problem. Taxpayers in this country are here to bail you out because if we don't bail you out, you're going to bring down the entire economy. That is absurd and we've got to end that. Robert Reich, President Clinton's former Labor Secretary, has said that, quote, no important public interest is served by allowing giant banks to grow too big to fail. Wall Street giants should be split up and soon, end of quote, and I agree with former Secretary Reich. Let me just touch on a few other issues that we have got to have the courage to deal with. I get calls all of the time. I do a national radio show, get it on the radio show, get it from Vermont. People are saying, we bailed out these large financial institutions, and what they then do is say thank you, and they raise my interest rates on my credit card to 25 or 30 percent. That is outrageous, that is usury, and we need to pass national usury laws. The truth of the matter is that today, one out of four credit card holders in this country are paying interest rates above 20 percent and as high as 41 percent, more than double what they paid in interest in 1990. Mr. President, what we need to do is pass national usury legislation, and I have introduced legislation that would mandate that the maximum interest rates that could be charged would be 15 percent. And the reason I came up with that number is that is exactly, exactly what credit unions are doing today, 15 percent, except under unusual circumstances. And I'm proud that on that bill we have, as co-sponsors, Senator Durbin, Senator Leahy, Senator Levin, Senator Hawken, and Senator Whitehouse. And that's what we have to do. It is immoral, it is wrong for these large companies to be charging 25 or 30 percent interest rates. It goes without saying, Mr. President, that as we take a look at Wall Street, we have got to bring back, we have to re-regulate that institution. Uh, we have to take a hard look at bringing back Glass-Steagall in one form or another. Lastly, Mr. President, we also need more transparency at the Federal Reserve. Uh, last year, when Secretary Bernanke came before the Budget Committee, I asked him a very simple question. I said, uh, Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that you have lent out 
over $2 trillion at zero interest to some of the largest financial institutions in, in America. Can you tell me who got the money? I mean, you're putting taxpayer money at risk. Who received this $2 trillion plus dollars? And amazingly enough, what Mr. Bernanke said, no, I'm not going to tell you. It's a big secret. Can't tell you. Well, on that day, we introduced legislation that would mandate that he tell us, and also uh, we would bring about a uh, GAO audit of the Fed. Uh, the Fed, especially uh, since the financial collapse, has assumed an enormous amount of power, and the American people have a right to have more transparency there. Uh, Mr. President, let me just conclude uh, by saying uh, that anybody who thinks this recession is over uh, has obviously not talked to real people. Uh, millions of people are hurting, millions of people are frightened, and they're looking for, to us for some immediate help in terms of extending unemployment benefits, but they're also looking to us to understand the causation of this problem and to work on ideas which will prevent the continued collapse of the middle class uh, in this country. So, Mr. President, we've got a lot of work on our hands, and uh, I look forward to working with you to bring that about. With that, I yield.